still care attendings at SUNY Downstate. Um, I was asked to give a lecture and it's a good thing he actually mentioned that there would be uh, people in the audience of all different levels because I predominantly did this lecture mostly for our pulmonary fellows. Um, so if I do actually speak really fast or say anything that you don't understand, please um, throw something in the chat or something or speak out. Um, uh, and that, that's, a, that's a great point. I apologize for not saying that. We will be monitoring the chat uh, and the, the Q&A section. Uh, so where this is a webinar, you have the ability to use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to place a question. Uh, and we will do our best to take them in the order that they're received and make sure Dr. Chow uh, knows about them because it'll be hard for her to monitor at the same time. Thank um, you, sorry. So I was asked to give a pulmonary disease uh, lecture for the geriatric um, contingent. And looking at this, basically, the one thing that we predominantly see in elderly patients is actually COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, I would give you a little bit um, brief background on this. So COPD is diagnosed via spirometry. And basically, we can do um, our clinical history and we can take um, signs and symptoms, but the actual gold standard for diagnosis requires spirometry, whether it's through a full pulmonary function testing or just bedside or office spirometry. And typically, the definition includes an FEV1 over FEC ratio of less than or equal to 0.7 or 70% as per gold criteria, or the lower limit of normal of the FEV1 over FEC in the American Thoracic Society's criteria. That is actually about 80%. So prevalence in the U.S. is about 7% in all individuals, but in those patients who are 65 years or older, we see a higher prevalence at about 10%. COPD in and of itself is actually a non-treatable disease. We actually only do symptom management and it comes with a very high mortality. So this is actually a bar graph um, dividing men and women between the ages of 18 to greater than 85 between 2007 and 2009. And you can see in the area um, where they're 65 years and older, this is the predominant prevalence of where patients are diagnosed with COPD. And this isn't just because of our um, risk factors that we have. Uh, if we look at the actual development of pulmonary lung function itself, we see that our optimum uh, lung function tends to be around the age of 20 to 25 and that every year after that, we see a slow decline in the lung function based on our spirometries. And you'll see that around age 60, we're down to about 80% of what our FEV1 predicted is. So I did mention that it is a uh, disease that has high mortality um, in terms of um, age standardized death rates. So you see in this graph that um, in the United States from around 2000 to 2014, we see about 40 um, deaths per 100,000 uh, people in the US population, more predominantly in men than female. And, oops, uh, and in terms of the leading cause of death in the US is actually the third leading cause behind um, ischemic heart disease. And in the world, it's also one of the protein causes. It has about 30 to $40 billion in healthcare costs to treat this disease. So when we look at these patients or they come to see us in the clinics, they typically have symptoms of dyspnea. Um, it can be progressive over time, typically is worse with exercise and persistent. It can be associated with a chronic cough. Um, these cough this cough can be intermittent and generally unproductive, and it could recur with wheezing. So um, when we have these patients who come in and see us with these complaints, we should always consider and send them for spirometry to evaluate for COPD. Um, patients who have had prior history of recurrent lower respiratory tract infections or genetic or congenital um, abnormalities can typically have a higher risk of developing COPD in the long term. The 
One of the bigger exposures now um, that we talk about in patients since the incidence and prevalence of smoking has actually decreased, we talk about in the world exposure to biomass fuels. So home cooking, heating fuels, um, people who do wood burning fires. And then there's also the risk factors that come from occupational um, jobs, such as chemicals and fumes. Occasionally we see patients um, who have a history of COPD and predict uh, typically, these are more predi um, predictable because of exposure when they're young to family members or other people within their groups that they grew up with who were smokers and giving them secondhand exposure. So your assessment and symptoms is generally done through questionnaires. We have two um, validated questionnaires. One is the Modified British Medical Research Council, which is a breathlessness scale. It's graded from zero to four. And this is actually one of the ones that um, they use in terms, it's easiest to use because really it's just, you're asking the patient, do they get breathless with exercise? What kind of exercise do they get breathless with? Or if they have, so they're so breathless that they just can't even leave the house or when they do any normal ADLs. The other one that we do typically use is the COPD assessment test, which is the CAT. Testing, it comes with eight questions you answer on a scale of zero to five, and the higher the score, it indicates the worst disease. So when we take these assessments and we classify, or we take the assessment answers with the spirometry information we got, we can classify these patients with COBD into gold groups. And this will help us in terms of actually treatment and management of them. So if you look in this, um, the gold um, criteria groups are patient groups A through D. And generally the typical characteristics is they have low risk, less symptoms if you're in the earlier groups and high risk, more symptoms if you're in the later groups. So the spir spirometric classifications, um, when they initially came out with this before the last iteration of the gold guidelines, it was included in the actual grouping of these patients. However, since then, we've noticed that some patients who have really bad spirometry, such as FEV1 less than 30, um, which typically lands you into a gold group of three to four, can still have less exacerbation. So those patients didn't really fall into any groups. So what we've done now is actually, um, sorry, changed it so that you can have the spirometry um, listed as outside of the gold group. So you say generally based on their FE1 predicted, um, they'll have the gold group here. And then you say comma group A, B, C, D, depending on where their um, MMRC or CAT scoring as well as hospital admissions. So if you see the lower actually low risk, uh, less symptomatic group A is here. And this is categorized in this Rubik's um, where with based on on one side exacerbations leading to hospital admission and, one, and the other side on symptoms. So this gives us our gold one to four group A through D. And this leads to actually what the actual guidelines for treatment of these patients are. Um, we see that the risk of exacerbation is the um, best predictor is that they have frequent exacerbations. It increases airflow limitations and can worsen throughout their course. Uh, other comorbidities in these patients tend to be cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, depression, anxiety, um, lung cancer. So once you have these categorized into groups, we can then treat them. However, all treatment, as I mentioned, was symptomatic. The only things that have actually helped change mortality in these patients is smoking sensation and primary prevention of vaccination. So smoking sensation um, reduces overall mortality, and typically they find that even physician or health professional delivered counseling increases quit rates. We do know that these patients with COPD and smoking actually are, uh, find it very difficult to quit, and less than one third of them actually became sustained quitters. On average, they typically take about three to four tries of quitting before they will actually stop. So um, we found uh, there was a study um, previously early in the 2000s called the Lung Health Study. It was um, 
done in patients who were early signs of COPD, which would categorize into the old one to two. They showed that smoking intervention uh, and bronchodilators versus smoking intervention and no intervention. The aggressive smoking intervention um, reduced age-related decline in the FEV1 in these middle-aged smokers and mild airway obstruction. Um, so bronchodilators, however, did not influence long-term decline in these patients. So really it was just the smoking intervention that helped these patients decrease the rate of decline of their lung function throughout the years. So in smoking sensation, there's what we consider the five A's of intervention. You ask, advise, assess. Um, and in this assessment, it is actually really important for the patient to be very honest. They have to determine the willingness and rationale of the patient's desire to quit. And usually we give them a timeline. If you're ready to quit, will you be able to do it in the next 30 days? If that's not true, then right then at that point during your um, clinic visit, they're not ready to quit yet. If they are ready to quit, you are going to provide um, assistance or aid, which can be typically a quit plan, counseling, pharmacotherapy, such as nicotine patches, Candix, um, Zyben. And it's always good to give them uh, numbers for uh, smoking cessation groups or counseling. And then generally we do arrange follow-up. It should be a follow-up contact, either a phone call or another visit to the office um, within about two weeks for these patients to see how they are in their plan. So the other thing that was actually shown um, to help for these patients in COPD and primary prevention is vaccinations. So, Influenza vaccination was shown to decrease illness and um, mortality in COPD patients. The, um, recently, we've had a little bit more controversial in terms of pneumococcal vaccine. So we all give the um, Pneumovax uh, 23 to patients greater than or equal to 65 years or older. And it's recommended for patients who are younger than 65 um, if they have COPD with significant comorbidities. It's decreased their rate of um, pneumonia, as well as um, uh, mortality. So up until about, I guess the last, I think about the last year, year and a half, we were also recommend, recommending Prevnar 13 um, for patients greater than or equal to 65 or with COPD. However, this year they did change that recommendation to be one where you were to discuss with the patient. It's not recommended unless they have issues such as cochlear implants or immunocompromised, um, because they found that the rates um, for uh, the serotypes in the Prevnar 13 were so low um, because in the current state that we are now, the vaccinations from childhood have um, actually managed to prevent the incidence of any of those serotypes from causing um, pneumonia within the elderly. So it's a, the Prevnar 13 is only um, is recommended to discuss risks and benefits with anybody greater than the age of 65 uh, before giving it, and you would only get it once. Whereas with the Pneumovax 23, it's recommended to give it at regular intervals after the age of 65 because we've shown that the immunization from it actually decreases over time. Okay. So we're going to move into actual treatments of stable COPD. Um, acute exacerbations of COPD we'll talk about a little later. And so our treatment goals for stable COPD are to reduce their risk factors, reduce their symptoms, um, and improve their basic quality of life in these patients, which is exercise tolerance and health status. Um, there's no current medication we have that can actually modify in the long term any decline in lung function for these patients. It actually only helps if they stop smoking, then the rate of lung function decline goes back to what we would be as a non-smoker after about five to 10 years. So um, with patients who we have uh, that do spirometry and their FEV1 is between 60 and 80% predicted, um, it's, a weak recommendation to give them some type of inhaled bronchodilators, PRN, for the respiratory symptoms. It hasn't really been found to show 
to improve quality of life that much with these patients. If you have patients diagnosed with COPD with FEV1s less than 60% predicted and symptoms, then it is recommended as a strong recommendation to prescribe them inhaled bronchodilators. You can use a monotherapy with either long-acting inhaled anticholinergics or inhaled LABAs, um, long-acting beta agonists, um, for symptomatic use, uh, basically PRN. Any uh, inhaled combination therapies um, can be done for these stable patients as well, but generally we try to do a monotherapy first. So um, pulmonary rehab is also recommended for patients with FEV1 less than 50%. Um, they found that this does help improve their quality of life um, in terms of post exacerbation. Uh, and then, of course, for all those patients with COPD that we see that have resting hypoxemia, which is actually considered less than or equal to 88% on your pulse oximeter or a PaO2 of less than or equal to 55 millimeters of mercury, we do recommend that they get long-term oxygen therapy. So those are like the basic guidelines. We'll cover the different classes of um, inhalers that we're going to use. So. I'm going to put out the preface first that um, any response to one class does not reply or imply that um, there's, there would be no response to another uh, or a different class of medications. Um, FEV response when acute bronchodilate, bronchodilator therapy doesn't predict long-term response. And all of these generally for the short-acting ones, the actual response that the patient feels can vary day to day or how uh, each time they use it, depending on if their inhaler technique is correct or not. So we have beta-2 agonists, anti-mascarinase, methoxanthine, which is like the awesome. So there's also short-acting, long-acting, and I'm gonna mention that in general, all patients should receive a short-acting bronchodilator for PRN use. Um, this is actually different compared to asthma uh, guidelines that have recently come out in regards to what they're short-acting or rescue medication is. Uh, Long-term improvements in symptoms, exercise capacity, and airflow limitation come from use of bronchodilators. So beta-2 agonists, uh, these are our albuterols, um, thalmuterol, things like that, that um, basically they inhibit airway smooth muscle cell proliferation and inflammatory mediator release. Uh, they reduce COPD exacerbation by about 50 to, uh, 15 to 20% and they increase mucociliary transport and clearance. So typical side effects that we see, especially in some of the elderly patients, tend to be tremor, reflex tachycardia. These tend to be more dosing related. So the more often these patients use their beta-2 agonists, the more likely they'll develop these types of symptoms. Um, and as we know, as inpatients, we tend to give for those patients who are hyperkalemic because it causes hypokalemia by causing a drive of potassium into the cellular. Um, milieu. Um, so in the elderly, we do caution use of beta agonists um, in the patients with cardiac disorder, ischemic heart, or unstable cardiac arrhythmia. Anti-muscarinics, these are um, used as well lung, um, to improve lung function and symptoms. They decrease hyperinflation, improve exercise capacity. So um, they have minimal cardiac uh, effects compared to the beta agonist, and they can um, reduce airway tone. So side effects um, on these patients, usually with the inhaled or nebulized, um, can cause dry mouth and occasional urinary symptoms. Uh, we usually tell our patients that these generally have a very poor systemic absorption when in, um, inhaled properly. We do caution the use of nebulizing solutions in patients with glaucoma because the nebulization can um, create an uh, airflow into the eyes if they aren't careful with that and cause um, issues. So for the group A COPD patients who are minimally symptomatic, low risk, we typically recommend beta-2 agonist as a PR. If it's a scheduled, it actually shows no benefit in terms of their symptom management. Um, their rapid onset of action. Um, you can also use anticholinergics, uh, which is ipratropium. So is there a difference between the abuse of beta uh, albuterol versus ipratropium? 
Um, they say that ipratropium alone has a small benefit over the albuterol short-acting beta agonists in terms of lung function, health status, requirement for oral steroids. However, I'm going to preface this with saying that generally the patient will have a preference in terms of what they feel actually helps them the most during their um, symptoms. So combination um, short-acting bronchodilators such as Promivent, um, so they, the two groups act in different ways in terms of um, bronchodilation. So the beta agonists are direct action on muscle, anticholinergic, reduce cholinergic um, tone, and predominantly proximal large airways. So the combination um, of use of both of these, it can cause more, a better bronchodilator response than one single agent. Um, hasn't changed in terms of decreasing um, possible exacerbation in these patients. So in those um, patients who are more symptomatic, which are group B with less than one hospitalization, so low risk of exacerbation, you can use a long-acting beta agonist or a long-acting antimuscarinic. And like I said, these selections are based mainly on the patient needs, um, how they feel using these medications and side effects. And Generally, we do prefer giving a LAMA over LABA. So a lot of these patients that you'll see initial inhaler therapy for them will be LAMAs. Um, so teotropium versus salmeterol um, had an increased time to first exacerbation, so less, um, less exacerbations over the follow-up period. So these are the different um, LABAs that are on the market. Uh, we try not to use them all, but I do have some patients who don't, um, whose insurances don't really cover llama lava combinations, so we've had to just give them two different inhalers at the same time. Uh, yeah. so, so the lavas um, were tried in a large randomized control study around 2017 called the Church Trial. Um, it was use of salmeterol uh, alone versus uh, fluticasone, which is an inhaled corticosteroid, or salmeterol plus fluticasone or placebo. So this was showing that a lot or salmeterol significantly decreased exacerbations um, and improved lung function and quality of life compared to placebo. They had a trend to decrease in all-cause mortality, but it didn't achieve statistical significance. Uh, I don't think you guys, this is more for the um, fellows in case they ever came across this. this is one of the newer uh, LABAs, our Captainuhaler um, in Bacterol. So this was um, just recently approved in 2011, and it showed that um, increase in Bacterol increased the um, FEV1 over placebo at a, um, more at 180 milliliters than Eutropium, which is a LAMA increased um, over placebo. So we have an approved dosage of 75 micrograms once a day in the US. However, in the European dosage is higher and actually what was actually used in the studies. Um, okay, so LAMA, our predominant LAMA that we use is Teotropium and it's been around for years. Um, the uplift trial uh, done in around 2008 was a randomized double blind trial, showed about 6,000 patients assigned to theotropium versus placebo. The mean absolute improvement in FEV1 was significantly compared to placebo and quality of life um, and exacerbations, but didn't reduce rate of decline of FEV1. So, Recently, um, we started having instead uh, two different ways of delivering teotropium. So that was brand name Spariva Handy Healer versus Spariva Respimat. And I don't know how many people have started using the Respimat. Um, I do find that it is more beneficial in our geriatric populations that have an issue with developing the inhalation um, airflow needed for a dry powdered inhaler. But there was, a, for a short period of time, based on meta-analysis, the concern that the Raspamet had a higher mortality in patients than the handy healer. So in about 2013, they did the um, TSPIR trial, which is Teotropium Safety and Performance in Raspamet. Uh, 
They took about 17,000 patients, randomized them to two different doses of rasvimat um, versus the hand inhaler at 18 micrograms per day. And we've all known that the hand inhaler only has one, resp uh, one dosing a day. Respimat 2.5 or 5 micrograms per day is actually their, um, their FDA-approved asthma versus COPD dosing um, for these patients. And the mean follow-up was 2.3 years. They showed no difference in risk of mortality in these patients. However, they did exclude cardiac patients with class 3 or 4 heart failure, um, recent MIs, or unstable life-threatening arrhythmias. So generally, we do say that um, the use of these new Respimat formulas haven't um, increased any type of mortality for these patients. These are the other llamas that recently came on onto the market. Um, Tudor's Apressor uh, basically improved baseline trough FEV1 stable, um, moderate to severe COPD. And compared to Teotropium, it has a higher um, nighttime FEV1. And therapeutic levels of this drug are actually reached faster than when you would, um, than if you were to start using them in teotropium. So it's two days compared to the about seven to 10 days it takes for teotropium. Um, Imiclidium or Incruzolipta is, um, was shown to be non-inferior to teotropium and it has a pretty much same side effect. It is also um, a dry powder inhaler. The Acladinium Tudorza Prestair is actually one of the only breath actuated dry powder inhalers, so coordination for these patients is actually a little easier. So for these bold group Bs, um, for any patient that's in, symptoms are not well controlled in monotherapy, um, we do recommend um, a combination therapy for them. And usually it's preferred Lobulama over the addition of an ICS. In these geriatric patients, typical use of ICS can increase the risk of pneumonia. Um, and they typically have lower likelihood of a asthma COPD overlap where ICS would be more beneficial to their symptom treatment. Um, so these are the different llama lavas we have on market right now. The Alta Respimat, which is Teotropium olibacterol and a noroelipta, which is a dry powder inhaler, umoclidium um, volantral. So other adjunctive therapies we can do for COPD, which is um, methoxanthines, it's a it's the ophelin. We usually haven't used it very much in the recent years. It's typically um, something that we use in very hard to control and um, asthmatic patients previously. It's a weak bronchodilator and predominantly used as a respiratory stimulant, improves diaphragmatic contractility. Um, there's a very minimal um, therapeutic window for these and levels have to be checked in patients all the time. Typically, they, most patients end up being with, uh, lower than what the therapeutic window is. Uh, and we limit this only to severe disease without, um, that haven't reached symptom control. So, now that we talked about those early COPD groups, um, A and B, which are minimal symptoms, minimal risk, um, we can move to the group C and D. So these are high risk of exacerbations and typically um, initial therapy with llama do reduce exacerbations, but if needed, if they're still having frequent hospital admissions, you can add um, ICS and lava with the llama. So, Alternatives also include, include the PDE4 inhibitors of theophylline. So inhaled corticosteroids in COPD modestly slows progression of respiratory symptoms. We can um, decrease exacerbations as shown in some in, uh, different randomized control trials. Um, the rate was reduced about 25% in the ISOL trial with um, fluticasone compared to placebo. And but in use of inhaled corticosteroids has little impact on their lung function and mortality. Um, and ICS and COPD should never be used as a monotherapy. So in combination with uh, either um, a long-acting bronchodilator, um, it improves outcomes to placebo or any monotherapy by itself. Adverse effects of use of inhaled corticosteroids can be subvascular cataracts, we do have uh, in the elderly patients um, increased, um, well, 
increased the increased incidence of decreased bone density. And you, a lot of them, we always have to recommend for any patient using an ICS to rinse their mouth out, brush their teeth, or clean out their mouth after use because you can develop oral candidiasis in these patients. Um, I don't think we need to cover the torch. Uh, so these studies, both um, the torch and Inspire trials were for LABA ICS combinations versus just the LAMA or sole placebo and show that they did have um, decreased rates of exacerbation in these patients. So all our combinations in terms of LABA ICS, you'll see here, um, predominantly used to use Advair and Simbacort. Now there's Ulera and Brio as well. Uh, so Brio actually is a once a day inhaler for most patients. So it's easier in terms of maintaining their medication regimen versus like the others, which are twice a day inhalers. Uh, so Lama Laba versus Laba ICS, okay. So in terms of this, um, they showed that Lama Laba in these patients reduced the rate of a mild severe CPD exacerbations by 11% compared to ICS Laba. So this was part of why we started recommending Lama Laba prior to use of a Laba ICS in these um, patients with frequent exacerbations. Um, so group D, which is our high risk, more symptomatic, um, typically get triple therapy. So uh, on the market now is Trilogy, which is fluticasone and leucidium and volantrol. Um, it's, <laughs> it helps them keep track of their inhalers because it's just one. Um, shown to decrease risk of mortality and hospitalizations and improve related quality of life. So PDE4 inhibitors. Um, this is used in our adjunctive therapy for severe diseases. Um, it uh, causes smooth muscle relaxation and anti-inflammatory effects. This is actually a better safety profile than theophylline. Um, and patients with history of exacerbations at least two per year or one hospitalization with chronic bronchitis. So this is actually um, Rofumilast or Dalaras um, brand name. It uh, can be added to any of the inhaler therapies. Um, and medication titration may reduce the rate of discontinuation because the predominant side effect that most people get from this when they initially start is diarrhea or abdominal upset. And that's... Um, usually why people stop the medication before they actually see any effect from it. So one of the other hot topics for patients is prophylactic antibiotics. We can recommend antibiotic therapy in CPD um, when uh, use in refractory COPD or frequent exacerbations, generally not meant for the stable COPD groups A, B, C. So mostly often we use macrolides because they're anti-inflammatory properties. Um, there were prior studies that showed erythromycin versus placebo, showed fewer exacerbations in the COPD group um, versus placebo. And then azithromycin um, for one year, uh, they had group, the azithromycin group had longer time to first exacerbation and a reduction in frequency of exacerbations. So we do typically benefit um, from prophylaxis, but it must be weighed against the concern of promoting antibiotic resistance and side effects um, said from macrolides. So the usual recommended dosing for these is azithromycin 250 milligrams PO daily, or a lower dose of 250 milligrams PO three times per week. And generally anywhere from 48 to 52 weeks, you should probably stop the, or interrupt the treatment and allow the patient to see how we will do without it. Um, this we, uh, we don't typically see alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in our patient population, but generally if this is the reason for COPD, the um, replacement therapy with alpha-1 proteinase inhibitor. Uh, so mucolytic agents. Um, mucus impaction may contribute to worsening of symptoms. We do have oral spectrums, but they failed to demonstrate any clinical efficacy in trials. Acetylcysteine and mucomus can thin the secretions of patients with chronic bronchitis. It has no effect on airflow or spoon volume. Um, I know that a lot of patients tend to like to nebulize this. Um, one, it smells like rotten eggs, but it can also cause significant bronchoconstriction when nebulized and inhaled, 
So it's recommended if you're doing this, give it with a bronchodilator at least, or give the albuterol um, nebulation at least 10 to 15 minutes before um, nebulizing the acetyl acetylcysteine. So one of the major problems in terms of medication delivery for geriatric patients is a uh, poor inhaler technique. So through all the medications that I just went over, there's multiple deliver, uh, different delivery mechanisms that can be used. Um, and the lack of education is usually the issue with older patients. Um, so it needs to be covered uh, in terms of any new medications you have and reinforce pretty much every visit or every other visit, how to use your inhalers and ask them to demonstrate them for you. We also know that in these elderly patients that it's, they have a reduced peak inspiratory flow. So at um, minimum, you need at least a 30 liter per minute um, inspiratory flow um, for effective medication delivery. And for any dry powder inhalers to reach the smaller airways, you need at least 60 liters per minute or a greater ideal flow rate. So for those patients who have severe CPD and cannot generate that, Dry powder inhalers would probably not be the best uh, inhaler to recommend for these patients or start them up. And then for those patients with cognitive impairments, nebulized medications, a sure better delivery, requires only tidal breathing. The only problem is the nebulizers have to be cleaned daily and you have a longer delivery time for these patients. So one of the major things I think would be helpful for um, geriatric patients and has been shown to improve a lot of um, daily symptoms and issues is that uh, they get recommended for pulmonary rehab. Now within Brooklyn, there's only one center right now, New York, um, uh, New York Presbyterian Methodist that has a pulmonary rehab um, division department where you can send out patients for this. Um, basically, pulmonary rehab is a multidisciplinary and comprehensive intervention that um, focuses on symptomatic um, issues for these patients, uncertain impact on mortality, um, which is why a lot of insurances don't cover uh, the cost of pulmonary rehab itself, um, whereas they cover rehab in general. So for those patients who are um, discharged from hospital post exacerbation, we do recommend that they get sent for pulmonary rehab or evaluated for it. And the minimum effective time within the rehab program is about six weeks. And over time after discharge from rehab program, the benefits are lost. So they, um, if they can, it would be beneficial if they went probably every year. So what it does do is it shows conditioning, breathing, uh, retraining, and psychosocial support. So conditioning for these patients, uh, lower extremity exercise is um, most frequent and better. You can do walking on treadmill or track or stair climbing exercise. However, for our patients who have very severe dyspnea with that or exertion who tell us they can't walk, you can also recommend upper extremity exercise, um, which is important for breathing. So repetitive arm motions um, using a table crank. And the recommendation is continuous exercise for at least 20 minutes. Um, interval training may be acceptable, but it isn't as effective. So with breathing retraining, uh, this is something where they have to be focused on how they're breathing. Um, we do say that sometimes for these patients, yoga is a good exercise. Um, for them because it focuses on movement with the breathing, inhalation, and exhalation, uh, pursed lip breathing. Um, and all of these can in help increase their tidal volume and oxygen saturation and dis uh, reduction in dyspnea. So mm, breathing through mouthpiece against resistance is usually where they tell them to breathe through different uh, size straws, um, not routinely done, but has mixed results and can help these patients control a pattern of breathing um, for some of them who can do this. In pulmonary rehab, before they start the program, they do what's a measure of exercise capacity for them. So a six minute walk test, um, which is the total distance walked um, during six minutes and a mean interval improvement or something that's considered significant 
um, is about 35 meters over that time period. These patients um, generally either do it with oxygen or without oxygen, and we monitor heart rate as well as pulse ox. Um, shuttle walk test is a little, um, a little different than the six minute walk test, but these patients walk between two cones at an increased speed or constant speed. Um, and then the most comprehensive thing we could do is cardiopulmonary exercise testing, um, which we don't actually do at King, uh, Downstate, but they do do over at Kings County. So you can send them over there for that if needed. So part of the other uh, geriatric psychosocial support is that we need um, patient education and support, help improve compliance and medication, oxygen therapy. You give them smoking sensation counseling, um, daily exercise regimens, and nutrition. So um, for psychosocial support, COPD is a risk factor for depression and contribute to anxiety, fatigue, and decreased sexual activity. So part of home rehab is also monitoring their mental health as well. Um, and nutrition. So pulmonary cachexia syndrome. Uh, about greater than 30% of patients can have a protein calorie malnutrition. And this ends up because the work of breathing, um, the calories and metabolism that's required for these patients to breathe is actually at a much higher level than normal patients. Um, they also feel uh, a decrease in appetite and do not um, maintain the balance between what they eat and calorie intake um, compared to what they actually expend. So um, regular exercise can improve effectiveness um, and stimulate appetite. Um, nutrition supplementation has not been demonstrated to benefit clinical outcomes, but the recommendation for these patients is small frequent meals with nutrient-dense foods, such as eggs, a raspy for meals, meals that require little preparation. We can do high caloric dietary supplements uh, with a three to one fat to carbohydrate ratio, and that the um, other options for appetite stimulants, not um, uh, things that I generally try to avoid, but will do if needed. You can give them megase or xandrolone, um, which is an anabolic steroid to promote weight gain. Uh, and then, so long-term oxygen therapy for these patients. Um, previously, we knew based on the NOT trial um, that long-term oxygen therapy for these patients improves survival, um, and the survival was correlated with the average daily duration of oxygen use. So most people, most of us recommend that these patients use it when they need it, but generally they had to use it for about greater than 15 hours a day of oxygen therapy to actually find the survival benefit um, in these patients. Uh, improved exercise tolerance, improves quality of life. Um, and so for the eligibility or insurance coverage of oxygen therapy, general indications is most of the time in clinics, we just measure a pulse oximeter. If it's less than eight or equal to 88%, they can qualify for oxygen therapy. Um, if you have core pulmonale, then anything um, with an oxygen saturation of less than or equal to 89%, um, and hematic greater than 55% if they have it, clinical evidence of right heart failure. So I know that there was, um, every time a patient comes and they ask for oxygen, uh, we all feel like that they should be getting it, but there was a trial done in 2017 called the Long Ox Long-Term Oxygen Therapy, uh, Oxygen Treatment Trial, the LOT trial, that actually looked at whether oxygen helps COPD patients with moderate hypoxemia. So anywhere from 89 to 93% pulse ox at rest. Um, and in these patients, uh, they measured, uh, either, they randomly assigned them to either two liters continuous oxygen or none, or um, for group two, they randomized assignment of two liters continuous oxygen during exercise and sleep or not, and they monitored them up to six years. So they found no difference in time to death or first hospitalization rate of exacerbations or rate of COPD related hospitalization. So oxygen for these patients actually had no significant clinical outcomes. Um, I think we have time to go over the management of acute exacerbations. Um, so acute exacerbations is basically an increase in symptoms beyond normal day-to-day -day variations. 
uh, sputum production increase in volume, increased dyspnea, cough, uh, increased severity or frequency. And basically for us, we just want to check what their oxygen saturation is at that time. Um, those who are admitted to the hospital generally get ABGs, um, chest x-rays to rule out any other diagnosis, blood work. So uh, pharmacotherapy and acute exacerbations, they get beta agonists and anticholinergics, nebulized usually because they can't create the um, peak inspiratory flows to take anything um, but a nebulization at tidal breathing. You can uh, supplement oxygen to titrate uh, pulse ox 88 to 92%, and then systemic corticosteroids, and predominantly we all use IV methylprednisolone. Um, it improves lung function symptoms and oxygenation. However, um, maximum benefit is during the first two weeks, and they found that no benefit for, there was no benefit for doses larger than 40 to 60 milligrams of prednisone or equivalents per day. So steroids did de um, uh, decrease uh, length of hospital stay, um, as well as reduces uh, treatment failure. Mm, antibiotics and acute exacerbations. So any patient mild CBD exacerbation, not hospitalized or mechanical ventilation, there wasn't any recommendation for antibiotic therapy. For those in moderate to severe exacerbation, um, they benefited from three to seven day course of oral or parental antibiotics. And the antibiotic regimen should target likely bacterial um, pathogens. So if you're treating them outpatient, augmentin, azithromycin, bactrim, chloroquinolones, or inpatient, you usually use third generation cephalosporins, levoquin, cefepime, um, zosin. And ventilator support. So non invasive ventilation, which is CPAP or BiPAP, predominantly BiPAP improves clinical outcomes in these patients. Um, so with hypercapnic acidosis, so this is typically after they evaluate the um, ABG um, for PCO2. Uh, so it decreased mortality, intubation rate, and treatment failure. In initial settings, um, we can use anywhere from eight over three to 10 over five. So inspiratory pressures of eight to 10, expiratory um, uh, pressures of three to five. Any patients who are contraindicated for non-invasive ventilation BiPAP should be intubated, and patients who fail to improve on non-invasive ventilation should um, be intubated as well. Okay, so the next sections of these are actually pretty uh, extensive in like what to do for those very severe COPD patients that um, don't uh, that would be referred out to other centers. So I don't know if um, you want to just stop here and give time for questions. So um, we're happy to take questions. The, the fellows are in the audience if, you, if, you, if there are no questions and you wanted to proceed. There haven't been any questions yet in the, in the Q&A or the chat. So, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you've been very thorough. <laughs> so, in terms of this, um, so I guess it's like eight more minutes then? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, one of the other referrals out, since we don't really have a thoracic program at um, Downstate, uh, lung, vo lung volume reduction surgery. So, you can do reduction pneumoplasty or bilateral pneumonectomies. What ends up happening is that you're reducing um, pretty much dead space area within the thoracic cavity and then lung transplant. These are for, both these options are for actually very severe um, COPD disease with um, symptoms. So lung volume reduction surgery in general um, improves mechanical function of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles by decreasing the functional residual capacity. Uh, when you move out the dead space, there's actually more room for, in general, functional lung to work. Um, it decreases central respiratory drive, ventilator response, and um, reduced dynamic hyperinflation during exercise. So this was um, studied in what was considered the NET trial, the National Emphysema Treatment Trial. It was the largest randomized controlled trial we had in the early 2000s. It took about... Um, 1,200 patients with severe emphysema. So after baseline assessment, these patients went through six to 10 weeks mandatory pulmonary rehab, like we talked about for these patients. 
and then they were randomly assigned to surgery or continued medical therapy. So most of the lung volume reduction surgery was performed by thoracotomy in 70% and video-assisted thoracoscopy in 30%. So thoracotomy generally has a longer recovery time because of how large the incision is and um, general splinting and pain for these patients. In this NET trial, primary endpoints were mortality, maximum exercise capacity at 24 months. So what they did find um, that in early subgroup analysis for these high-risk group patients for which were considered patients with FEV1 less than or equal to 20% predicted and one of the following, so homogeneous emphysema, meaning that emphysema was predominantly the same throughout bilateral upper and lower zones, um, these patients had an increased risk of death. Um, subsequent high-risk patients were then excluded from enrollment in the NAT trial and um, went on to go to see two years total mortality did not differ between the rest of the groups. So um, improvement in exercise capacity was statistically and clinically significant in the lung volume reduction surgery group. But when we look at all the different subgroup analysis for these patients, basically patients with upper lobe predominance and low exercise capacity. So upper lobe predominance of emphysema and low exercise capacity showed a reduced long-term mortality they had short and long-term, which is the two years improvement of exercise capacity and quality of life. Patients with upper load predominance and high exercise capacity before undergoing surgery had no impact on mortality, and they did notice an improvement in exercise capacity and quality of life. If you had a non-upper load predominance, meaning lower load um, predominance of emphysema, low exercise capacity, these patients actually had a slightly increased 90-day mortality and no effect at 24 months. No long-term effect or improvement in terms of exercise capacity either. And for those patients with lower lobe, which is non-upper lobe predominance and high exercise capacity, they had increased 90-day mortality. So if you look at this, generally anybody with lower lobe predominance emphysema did not do better. So in, can in terms of what candidates should go for lung volume reduction surgery, age less than 75 years old, um, severe dyspnea symptoms despite medical therapy and maximum um, pulmonary rehab, which is six to 10 weeks. They have to have smoking cessation for greater than six months. And their FEV1 is anywhere between 20 and 45% predicted. DLCO is greater than 20. Air trapping, which is your residual volume, is greater than 150% predicted. Um, and then on the high resolution CAT scan, you should see hyperinflation heterogeneously distributed emphysema, mostly in the upper lung zones. Um, they do recommend that these patients um, with the post rehab have a six minute walk test greater than 140 meters um, for these patients and these patients would benefit. So post lung volume reduction surgery, um, complication, general operative mortality was about 6% in these patients. Uh, major pulmonary morbidity, 30%. Um, and most of the common complications required reintubation, arrhythmia, or a persistent air leak. So when you manage to cut out part of the lung, they do leave chest tubes um, in to monitor if the lung heals, the lung floor heals itself, or there's air leaks. So about 12% of these patients after the lung volume reduction had a persistent air leak for about 30 days, which can Need some more complications, but um, generally can be managed. And so less common complications as um, for any type of surgery, MIs, DVTs, PEs, and wound infection. So long-term outcomes for these patients improved in dyspnea scoring, quality of life. They had a resting elevation in their uh, pulmonary arterial oxygen saturation, more likely um, and their BOAT index improved significantly. So BOAT index is an index that we use to predict COPT, COPD mortality in patients. Um, so it's like BMI, um, FEV1, dyspnea scoring, um, oh dear, emphysema. Yeah, improved um, significantly and correlated with five-year survival. Um, the other thing is that lung volume reduction surgery is substantially more costly than medical therapy in patients. Uh, the one other thing that you can do for severe COPD patients is send them for lung transplant. So when you compare lung volume reduction surgery and transplant 
Um, basically, LVRS resulted in substantial improvements, um, but lung transplant was actually superior. Um, and having done LVRS first doesn't exclude a patient from undergoing lung transplant. Uh, currently, right now, lung transplant COPD is the most common indication. Uh, functional capacity is improved with the procedure, and there's multiple different guidelines for patients who can be sent for uh, lung transplant. Currently, within New York City, we have one, two, three lung transplant centers. Two were opened within the last like three years. Uh, so it's either um, so for lung transplant, we've moved more predominantly for bilateral trunk bilateral lung transplants. It used to be that they would do single lung transplants. However, they noticed that the, in these patients with native lung, um, they can develop severe hyperinflation, compressing the transplanted lung, um, and also leading cause of uh, long-term death is chronic injection. So with these um, bilateral lung transplants, they usually survive longer than single lung transplants. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had one question from the, the audience. Yes. Um, uh, from Dr. Gerard, so, uh, Shirley Gerard. So if I am an NP or MD in the primary care setting, uh, treating someone with COPD, how do I manage them? Should their lung care be referred? And where, sort of, sort of where do we draw the line between uh, PCP care and uh, specialty care? So for me, I actually feel that PCP and geriatrics in general um, are very capable of taking care of most um, mild, moderate COPD patients. When we move on to the severe COPD patients in terms of using adjunctive therapies such as theophylline, reflumolast, or patients who have continued frequent um, hospitalizations or symptoms despite using like um, triple inhaler therapy, oxygen therapy. Um, those are patients I think should be referred to a specialist because then the, I'm not sure how much in terms of primary care that they can focus on learning about all these other new options and treatments of uh, COPD. Because right now we're talking about lung volume reduction surgery, which has been around for like uh, 10, 20 years lung transplant, but right now pulmonary is also doing studies on um, intrabronchial coils um, in terms of one-way valves for non uh, relatively minimally invasive lung volume reduction surgery. Um, and actually we hired an interventionalist now who is trying to start that at downstate. So in terms of like the earlier stages like group um, A, B, and C, I think are uh, primary care and geriatrics are perfectly capable of uh, managing these types of patients. Um, it's when you get to the severe and frequent symptomatics despite um, inhaler therapy, I think that they should be referred. I think that's it. Any questions? So thank you for uh, a fantastic talk on COPD and laid life. And thank you again so much, Dr. Chow, for your time and uh, dedication and, and very detailed presentation. It was great.